So guys, uh, we've seen pretty much all the theoretical background that I wanted to show you here for bankroll management. I also looked at a few of the tools that I've created for you guys, which again you'll get at winnerinaweek.com. And now I want to go into the real money hand uh, examples that will illustrate variance in all of its brutality. Uh, these are actual hands that I myself played uh, at real money tables at I think primarily the middle middle and lower limits um, which is where I want most of you guys to start playing and what I've done is created an overview of how this worked out and what we'll do is probably end this video here uh, with this overview and then get into the actual hands as a means for you to see exactly how that went down but I'll just go over this quickly as an overview before we get there these are the stakes played no limit 100 means the big blind was 1 and the small blind was 50 cents. No limit 1,000 means that the big blind was 10 and the small blind was 5. No limit 200 again, blinds of 1 and 2. And L50 is blinds of 25 cents and 50 cents. And I think the great majority of you guys will be playing when you get started around this level. If not lower, there's nothing wrong with starting at NL10, NL25, absolutely not. Get in there, get your feet wet, figure it out, get your misclicks out of the way. <laughs> and uh, you know learn learn the ropes at the smaller stakes and then move up as your bankroll allows so we've got here a strategy employed the hybrid is again the mid stack strategy uh, somewhere between 30 and uh, say 80 or 100 big blinds big stack strategy is always buying in for the full 100 big blinds small stack strategy is anywhere from the even 5 to 25 big blinds but especially when you buy in for 20 and yeah you see the different sites stuff like that what we've got here is heroes effective stack and the hero in online poker terms is always you uh, in this case as I wrote below me and this is basically where I started so I'm playing an NL100 game and my stack in this hand was at the beginning of the round $31.50 so I had 31.5 big blinds in my stack so I was playing a so-called hybrid strategy good there are the big blinds I guess already calculated for you. My hand, the hero's hand, was ace-king offsuit. The villain's hand, and the villain, again, in online poker terms, is your opponent. So you have the hero versus the villain, or the villains. And in this case, it's the only example hand that I have where it was a three-way all-in pot. So, unbelievably, uh, in this very first hand that we'll look at, you know, I had ace-king, and there were two other players who had ace-king offsuit and ace-queen suited. It's highly unlikely. Uh, especially given the flop that was to come. Good. The effective pot means the pot limited by the smallest stack. So that's a so-called effective pot, which was, I believe in this case, my effective stack. Right. So 3150 was as high as I could go. So 3150 times 3, yeah, there you go, plus probably a couple blinds. The rake that was taken at the end was 3 bucks. And here's a breakdown of the equity pre-flop. So a lot of even coaches sometimes will lead you to believe that you need you know 50% on average um, to be making money. <laughs> Not necessarily true, especially when you're in three and four way pots. So let that be you know lesson to you. Your break even equity doesn't necessarily need to be even 20%. It just depends on the circumstance. Uh, in this case, three-way with my effective stack, I'm going to need about 33%, but there was a bit of dead money from the blinds that were posted, uh, and you got to take rake into consideration these kind of factors. But anyways, um, my equity pre-flop, as we'll see in the replay, was 34%, so I was just ahead, if I were to go in pre-flop, I was just ahead of um, the equity I needed to break even or make even a bit of profit in the long run. So my heroes uh, are equity at the moment of going all in, the so-called push, was 47%, as you guys will see here shortly in the replay. And what I expect um, to return, if I were to go all in pre-flop, would have been 31.45, which would have been a really small loser. All right, so five cents loss. However, we went all in post-flop. So my EV, my expected value, at the moment of going all in, at the push, was 43.48 for a 
pretty decent return. Right? Um, now, this is equity based on perfect information. That means the hands we're going to see in the replay are ad hoc hands. That, mean they, that means they've been played and we know what the opponents are holding with complete certainty. So that means we have all the information that we can have in a game of poker. That is never the case in clean games <laughs> where you're not cheating or the other players aren't cheating. So in all other circumstances, you're not playing against uh, an opponent or a villain's specific holding, rather an entire range of holdings, so-called range of hands. So our all-in equity versus the opponent's range was um, not 47%, but right at 45%. So this is what you need to keep in mind when we move forward. And I'm going to use these example hands to kind of get you guys uh, familiar with the Texas, the Texas Hold'em uh, Manager Replayer and yeah, how, how this then works out with perfect information and then against uh, entire ranges of hands for your opponents. So I hope that's clear. Don't worry if it's not at this moment. It will become clear shortly. Um, what we've got here is all in equity versus their assumed range versus your opponent's total list of hands and the hero or our expected value versus the villain's again yeah assumed range fold equity very simply put is the likelihood or the percentage of the time that your opponents will fold right and that's calculated in your expected value calculations differently but we're just gonna leave that out for now just for simplicity we're just gonna say okay our expected value based on our equity versus our assumed opponent's ranges. So we've got here a cold call versus a squeeze, preflop, and we'll get into the definitions in the coming videos, of any pair, any ace-nine suited, any king-ten king ten suited or better. You guys see these pluses, that means twos are better. Ace-nine are better. Suited means ace-ten suited, ace-jack suited, ace-queen suited, ace-king suited. King 10 suited, of course, means King 10 suited, King Queen suited, like this, uh, King Jack and King Queen suited, uh, all the way down the line, as you guys see here. And we did get it all in at the flop, right? So um, what we put these guys on as a range for a flop call was Jacks are better, Sevens. Uh, not clear as to how that one popped in. Ah, okay, because of the set value. Uh, you guys will see the flop here shortly, but um, jacks are better, sevens, a seven suited or better, king jack suited or better, queen uh, all the way down the line, given the, the board texture. Okay, and this is a so-called range of hands that we give our opponents based on our knowledge of the opponents, based on player profiling, based on the flop texture, and many other factors. So these are things that you should keep in mind when we look at the uh, example hands in the replayer uh, in the coming video and again as a brief overview I think we'll just end end here with the following um, these are our I believe 15 hands our total stack in all of these hands total the total investment that we had was 1000 in a bit uh, the total pots minus the rake was around 2000 right our equity preflop was on average 57%. And one of those was in a three-way pot where we only needed 33% or a bit less to break even. Our equity at the push was on average 41% versus, again, the exact holding of our opponents, which we can never know in reality and in, in actual playing conditions. So our expected value preflop, knowing our opponent's holding, was $1,202. Right, and our expected value at the point of a push, knowing their holdings was 844. Now, our all-in equity versus their ranges on average, at the point of moving all-in was 65% versus the opponent's assumed ranges, and that means when looking at this, our total expected value in actual playing conditions was 1,352 which is markedly more than the thousand that we invested initially in these 15 hands.
this is all to give you guys an idea of how variance functions in the real world. So guys, uh, this will become very clear as soon as we look at the actual hands in the replayer. But I wanted to show this to you as um, a general overview to kind of um, yeah, make everything clear, give you a good foundation before we actually get into the details. And for that, I've written the following uh, overview. So if quote-unquote variance didn't exist, what would have happened to the hero's bankroll? The hero, as mentioned before, is always you in poker terminology. Okay, me in this case, in these 15 hands. The best answer is calculated by subtracting the total investment, i.e. the effective stack above, fr from the average EV versus the villains, i.e. the opponents, estimated total hand ranges at the point of moving all in, which gives you the, the estimated expected bankroll change. So, in these 15 hands, the hero's profit should have been $345.95 for a new bankroll of $1352 which is essentially the investment right here plus the change in EV right here based on the villains actual holdings in these hands the hero's bankroll should have been 1202 if all of the pushes had occurred preflop that means that our preflop e equity versus their actual holdings was 57 percent and that on average given these different limits and effective stacks would have come out to an increased bankroll of about 20% if all the pushes had occurred preflop. And here we go, guys. Variance. However, the hero, i.e., I, <laughs> lost every single hand above, all 15, in spite of being the market favorite on average for a net loss of not 200 or 352 or something like that, but for the entire investment of $1,006.05 at, okay, excluding NL1000 uh, here, at pretty much the low and mid limits. That is one hell of a swing, guys, when you are both pre-flop and post-flop the market favorite. But that is actually how it, how it went down in these 15 example hands that I want to show you to really bring this point home, to show you just how true and how real variance is, even when you play uh, mathematically perfectly, as we see here. So, um, I've continued here just to clear all this up. Another point to consider is sometimes you only need 20 to 30 percent equity, even less, to break even in the long run. That means when you're in multi-way pots, for example, um, or when there's a lot of dead money on post-flop streets, etc. So that means a lot of the stats that you see in, in Hold a Manager, for example, um, you know, if you don't see a over 50 percent in your equity uh, for your pushes, your all-in moves, then it's not necessarily a bad thing. You really have to be, you have to distinguish there to see, you know, what your break-even equity was in relation to your actual uh, equity given their, given their ranges. So just keep that in mind. You know, sometimes you need only 20 or 30 percent to break even in the long run. I've written here, winning at poker is in most cases the sum of many small edges. Approaching infinity, your profit in all-in situations is your equity advantage multiplied by the whole pot, including your bets. So here's an example. You hold tens in the small blind, you raise it, versus your opponent or your villain in the big blind who holds or who's holding ace-king suited. The equity matchup there is 54% for you and 46% for your opponent, giving you an 8% equity advantage. You break even equity needed is about 50% if you don't include the rake and yeah in order to break even which is your so-called break even equity in this example your profit is your equity percentage versus your opponent's actual holding or range less your break even equity <laughs> multiplied by the total pot and this is just your really simple EV equation your equity minus the equity you need to break even uh, times the pot equals your expected value more or less, more or less. And that's um, very simplified uh, for the math guys out there. I know you're probably screaming. Um, again, this is the intro video. We get into much more detail <laughs> in the coming videos. But that as a general rule is, you know, something you can take home. Um, there's a certain percentage chance that you need to win, i.e. your equity, 
in order to break even, given the pot. And yeah, when it adds up like this and you're in a positive EV situation, that's a good thing. When you're in a negative EV situation, you need to let it go. And this is the final point uh, before we get into these hands. Uh, right here, my online mentor told me about a simulation program of winning players who were winning at an average of two big blinds per 100 hands played at no limit 400. It means the small blind was two and the big blind was four. And this simulation program then analyzed players' swings over millions of hands at this level. Millions, literally millions. The biggest swing was $24,000, i.e. 60 buy-ins if playing a big stack strategy. I'm going to pause there and let that sink in. These guys were playing no limit hold'em, blinds of two euros or two dollars and four dollars, and the biggest swings of winning players, players who are winning two big two big blinds per hundred. That swing was 24k, 60 buy-ins, just based on hard luck, just based on variance alone. Pretty sick. So. It was apparently even possible for these players to still be break even, i.e., plus minus zero in their initial bankroll, after 200,000 hands. <laughs> these guys are the swings that you need to be ready for and the reason you need to adhere to bankroll management. And I conclude here uh, I admit that I wasn't able to inspect this program's calculations, but based on my personal experience uh, with variants and that of my friends who are also semi professional players. Uh, these numbers could well mirror actual results of even highly skilled players at the middle limits. And that's what I want you guys to really, really not only understand, but also very much believe. Because in my experience, what happens is um, players, you know, they, they buy in for the 1,000 or the 2,000 total bankroll. They play it in a 100. They kind of, you know, oscillate back and forth, plus minus two, 300 bucks. And they're getting a bit bored. And then they jump up to NL200 and NL400. And all of a sudden, they don't have the bankroll to handle the swings. And by and large, the players are better at the higher levels. So that means um, when they move up, they're facing better competition on average at bankrolls that um, are at a level that their bankroll can't actually uh, can actually take. So one of two things happen: if they win. Fantastic, great, um, yeah, congratulations. Very rarely will that be the case because you're going to have, again, better players and you're going to have the same amount of variance at that level, which will hurt you much more, exponentially more, given your reduced uh, bankroll in relation to those blinds. So with that, guys, I think we've reached the end of our theoretical section for bankroll management. And as promised, we'll get into the example hands here shortly to bring all this home on a very practical level, make all this uh, theoretical knowledge very clear to you, and again, show you exactly why you should definitely always adhere to very strict bankroll management. Again, my name's Dylan, and if you guys have any questions, as always, please feel free to contact me at any time. Till next time, best of luck, and best of luck at the tables.